Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're taking a look at the history of iTunes, but I want to address something before we begin. Many of you are recommending different video ideas, which I really do appreciate, so keep them coming, but you should know that there's a voting poll almost every week where I ask my subscribers which video they'd like to see next. Here's the poll for this video. So if you want to vote, make sure you're subscribed or else the polls won't show up in your activity feed. Now without further ado, let's begin. The story of iTunes is full of excitement, disappointment, and even some controversy that all began in 2001. Now at this time, the iPod didn't exist and playing music from CDs was standard. There were MP3 players, but the industry was still in its infancy and wouldn't explode until a few years after the iPod was released. Most computers were capable of importing songs from CDs, and this created a problem with managing those song files effectively. The most popular desktop music managers were Real Jukebox, Windows Media Player, and Music Match. The problem with these applications was that they were not only unappealing and complicated, but they throttled things like encode quality and CD burning speed to encourage users to pay for the software's pro version. Apple capitalized on these shortcomings by introducing a free, simple, and powerful digital music jukebox called iTunes. Now I should mention that iTunes, like Siri, wasn't made by Apple. It was developed by Jeff Robin and Bill Kincaid, who had previously worked as Apple software engineers for the Copeland project but left Apple when the project was canceled. They went on to create a media player for the Mac in 1998 called SoundJam MP. The media player caught Apple's eye and they later acquired SoundJam MP in 2000. Robin and Kincaid continued to develop their media player as employees of Apple and simplified its user interface, added the ability to burn CDs, and removed its recording feature and skin support. It was then branded as iTunes and released to the public in 2001. iTunes was advertised as the world's best and easiest to use jukebox software and it was only available on the Mac. Steve Jobs said, Apple has done what Apple does best, make complex applications easy and make them even more powerful in the process. iTunes is miles ahead of every other jukebox application and we hope its dramatically simpler user interface will bring even more people into the digital music revolution. Reception to iTunes was positive, with critics praising the ability to turn audio tracks into MP3 files, play internet radio broadcasts, burn custom CDs, and transfer MP3 files between a Mac and a standalone music player. But there were some complaints about Apple removing features that SoundJam MP used to have. Things like custom skins, additional visualizer plugins, and the ability to record sound from a cassette. The first update to iTunes came just nine months later and included support for the iPod, improved improvements to CD burning, and a sound equalizer. Apple referred to this update as iTunes 2, but there wasn't very much excitement surrounding its release since the upgrade didn't introduce any groundbreaking features. And the same was true for iTunes 3 the following year, which featured smart playlists, the My Rating column, and support for audiobooks purchased from audible.com. But the real exciting features weren't included until iTunes 4 in 2003. A new user interface was added along with the iTunes Music Store, which was the main contributor to iTunes tremendous success. Now you may find it odd that it took four versions of iTunes before Apple included a music store, but that's because creating a legal digital music marketplace had never been done before. Apple was writing the book as they went along and initially faced stiff opposition from record labels. But before we get into that, let's understand how Apple recognized the need for a music store to begin with. Initially, the main purpose of iTunes was to simply serve as an easy way to rip songs from CDs, mix them into playlists, and burn those playlists to blank discs. This process marked a paradigm shift in the way consumers managed music. They were becoming more comfortable with digital song files and listening to those songs on their MP3 players or iTunes. No longer were consumers using CDs to store and listen to their music. The role of CDs then was to simply transport music from the record store to your computer, because after the songs were imported to iTunes, the CD no longer had much of a purpose. This behavior contributed to the growing need for a digital music marketplace. After all, it'd be much easier to purchase digital music directly to your computer and save time you would have spent driving to a record store and then importing all your songs at home. Consumers were also annoyed that buying songs individually wasn't possible. Some solutions to this problem did surface, but they weren't necessarily legal. File sharing applications like Napster and LimeWire became quite popular in the early 2000s since they allowed users to download individual mp3 files directly to their computer. But because these services were illegal, the music industry retaliated by trying to shut them down and they were successful but it took many years. 
Throughout this time, digital music downloads developed a bad reputation since they became synonymous with piracy. In 2006, Weird Al Yankovic even released a parody single titled Don't Download This Song, whose title may seem confusing since downloading songs today with Spotify and Apple Music is perfectly legal, but these legal music downloading services weren't available 15 years ago. Steve Jobs had an interesting quote about piracy that summed up the situation quite well. He said, We believe that 80% of the people stealing stuff don't don't want to be, there's just no legal alternative. So we said, let's create a legal alternative to this. Everybody wins, music companies win, the artists win, Apple wins, and the user wins because he gets a better service and doesn't have to be a thief. But the idea of a digital music marketplace wasn't popular with music executives at the time, and their concerns weren't necessarily unfounded. They worried about profit margins. Why would anyone buy $15 albums if they could just spend a few dollars handpicking their favorite songs? They also worried about piracy. How would they prevent digital song files from being illegally resold and distributed? But most of all, they worried about losing control of the retail music marketplace. If everyone buys music from the iTunes store, then that gives Apple an unprecedented amount of bargaining power over the record labels, power the record executives weren't willing to give up. But Steve Jobs knew digital sales was the only way forward for the music industry and he was successful in persuading labels to at least give it a try. This was partly because of Apple's limited role in the computer industry. Labels saw the Macintosh market, which represented less than 5% of the total US computer market, as a small, relatively safe way to experiment with Jobs' ideas. The iTunes Music Store offered 200,000 songs at its time of release and allowed customers to quickly find, purchase, and download those songs for just 99 cents each, without subscription fees. And customers could burn their songs onto an unlimited number of CDs for personal use, listen to songs on an unlimited number of iPods, play songs on up to three Mac computers, and use songs and applications on the Mac like iMovie and iDVD iTunes was widely used among Mac users, but it didn't explode in popularity until it was released for Windows in October 2003. In just three and a half days after its release, iTunes for Windows was downloaded over a million times and secured iTunes' position as the number one digital music marketplace in the world. Digital music sales eventually exceeded CDs, but it's important to point out that overall music sales began to decline in 2004 and it was due to one factor in particular, the shift from digital music purchases to streaming services like Pandora and YouTube, who offered free music streaming with varying feature restrictions and ads that could be removed with a monthly subscription. iTunes remained successful during this transitional period and received annual updates, but Apple saw the writing on the wall and tried competing with streaming services like Pandora by introducing iTunes Radio in 2013. It experienced mild success, but was never able to dominate its competition like the iTunes Music Store had. To make matters worse, a Swedish company called Spotify brought their music streaming service to the US in 2011 and was gaining incredible traction with customers. Spotify offered on-demand music streaming in addition to radio services and it was supported by ads which made the service free, although users could pay a $9.99 monthly subscription fee to remove ads and other restrictions. As popularity of Spotify exploded, it marked another paradigm shift in the way consumers manage their music. Buying songs digitally and syncing them to various devices became antiquated since consumers could simply download an app and stream any song they like from any device. Other music streaming services were created to compete with Spotify like Tidal and Beats Music, but these music services were only able to put a small dent in Spotify's on-demand music streaming market share. In 2014, Apple acquired Beats Electronics in a $3 billion deal and brought on its executives Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre to help develop Apple's own music streaming service called Apple Music which was released in 2015. Apple Music was integrated with iTunes 12, a controversial decision since iTunes was already quite bloated and resource heavy even without the addition of Apple Music. Many users felt that because iTunes needed to be trimmed down, establishing Apple Music as a separate app would be a smarter choice. But Apple felt differently and baked Apple Music right into iTunes. Apple promoted the service heavily with various ad campaigns to get it off to a strong start. Reception to Apple Music was mixed. Many criticized the user interface for being messy and unintuitive, while others praised its quality playlist curation. In iOS 10, the music app received an updated user interface with less clutter, improved navigation, and a larger emphasis on users' libraries, but issues with the service persisted. One 
one of Apple Music's features is something called iTunes Match, which allows you to upload existing music you already own to your iCloud Music Library so you can share those songs with your other devices. Unfortunately, this feature caused significant issues for some users, like duplicate songs, missing tracks, and synchronization problems. There were also reports of user-uploaded music being replaced by versions locked with digital rights management, an issue Apple later fixed. Despite these hiccups, Apple Music experienced rapid growth after its launch, passing the milestone of 10 million subscribers after just six months and 40 million as of April 2018. Today, Apple Music is Spotify's biggest competitor, and because Apple Music is gaining subscribers at a faster rate than Spotify, it's set to surpass Spotify for the number one spot in summer 2018. Now even though streaming is the most popular way to listen to music, Apple continues to sell music from the iTunes store, although sales have been declining since 2012. Rumors have been circulating about whether or not Apple will close the iTunes store in the near future. And although Apple hasn't made any official announcements on the subject, an anonymous source close to Apple said keeping the iTunes store running forever isn't really on the table anymore. They plan on writing the iTunes music store out for the next two to three years, maybe longer. If Jobs was alive, he would have killed it. The end of the iTunes Music Store may be inevitable, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. After all, the iTunes Store offers more than just music, and as long as customers are buying, it wouldn't make much sense to shut it down. But what do you guys think? Should Apple end the iTunes Music Store in order to focus their energy on Apple Music, or is there still a good reason to keep the declining digital media marketplace alive? Let me know what you think, and if you want to vote for next week's video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.